Hello, everybody. Good evening. Buenas tardes. I'm Patricia Perez, AARP California State President Emeritus. Bienvenidos a todos. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our Let's Talk Dinero. And today's chat will be focusing on financial health and resilience. Get, so get ready to take a lot of notes because we'll be providing lots of good resources to you today. To help us with our discussion today, it's my pleasure to welcome back Felipe Ocampo. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He's a licensed clinical social worker at the Whittier Counseling Center and clinical lead for the United Mental Health Promoters Program at the LA County Department of Mental Health. He received his master's of social work at Cal State Dominguez Hills. And I know some of you are joining us right now, so get ready for this dynamic conversation. But before we turn the program over to Felipe, I would like to get to know the people joining us a little bit better. So we're gonna start right off the bat by taking a quick poll. I just really wanna know, you know, let's get Felipe some information about all of you. And the question is simple. I worry and stress about money. So, Please let us know. I worry and and stress about money. Felipe, can you see the poll? Yes, I can. All right. Oh, that's great. We have some, you know, people who are not stressed about money. <gasps> that's fantastic. So please, just yes or no. Are you stressed about money or you feel very, you know, good about it? Felipe, it looks like the majority of the audience is pretty cool with it. Seems like, you know, they're not too stressed. Either they've got, a, you know, a, a really great financial plan and financial advisors, or maybe they just like, eh, whatever. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. So, yeah, it came to like 60 40. That's pretty. Or let me see. Uh, Let's see, share results. Maybe that come, came up. Perfect. So that was the final 60, 40, pretty good. All right, so let's go. Uh, I wanna turn now the, the program over, you know, now that we know that people are pretty okay uh, about finances, there's, there were still like 40% of our audience who's still a little stressed, but I wanna turn it over to Felipe so he can tell us about financial health and resilience. Felipe, por favor. Thank you, Patricia. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so you can see a few slides and information that I'll be presenting and speaking about for today. And thank you everyone for being here. All right, so hopefully everyone can see my screen. So uh, welcome, um, I'm here just to share a little bit of information and also it sounds like some are doing well, not feeling stressed about money, but maybe that might be at this moment, but we know that at other points in our life or in, our, uh, in the past, we might have been feeling stressed and that's something that's really important for me. So I wanted to share some information and um, assistance and, and skills and whatever can be added to your toolbox to assist you because we know it's important to have good financial health and uh, helps us to have good overall health and also to have good resilience to be able to bounce back from adversity. So uh, I wanted to just share um, some highlights. There's a lot of information packed in these key findings from a uh, survey um, back from back in 2018 for especially for our older adult population. Uh, some things that I, I found interesting from here were that um, it's for our older adult population, about 25% uh, found themselves feeling financially insecure, and that that increased uh, when you, when you happen to be in your later 70s. Uh, so you're doing fina financially okay, and then as you uh, get older and about late 70s is when they show that 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 score tends to drop, and then people start to feel you know, financially insecure. Uh, and that for me is important because I see clients and I see patients um, uh, in a therapeutic fashion, but. Uh, I, I take that the importance of that because I see that people are stressed and they're um, unable to cope at times with it. And uh, I hope that what we talk about today can help assist those, maybe not yourselves, or maybe someone that you know uh, in your life that may need that help. Uh, another thing that I found uh, important, especially for a Latino community, is that um, 
especially during the pandemic, we were increasingly at one of the, the subpopulations with the highest unemployment rate. And we know that if you have no income coming, that that creates a lot of stress. And uh, that that's something that we're still uh, combating or, or having struggles with. And that uh, and increasingly also we saw that um, our Latino community also uh, in a 2019 survey struggles to uh, recover from even um, emergency situations at the $400. So if you have something that surges, like a, your car breaks down and it's about $400, that that's that's uh, such a, a a big struggle for about half of our uh, community that got surveyed in this in this survey. Uh, for me, that's alarming because that uh, tells me that we're not preparing, we're not doing, uh, we're not financially secure where we can prepare for those types of situations, and um, and we know that those those situations can happen in many ways. Uh, we had a lot of loss in the pandemic, and uh, that uh, in addition to the emotional toll, there's also financial. Uh, payments that need to be made, arrangements, uh, and that brings a lot of stress. So that, that's one of the reasons I, I really wanted to share this information, but also um, bring it up as something to think about. Uh, so <clears throat> what is financial resilience? It, it's really the ability to bounce back from uh, life-altering setbacks and impact uh, to our personal finances. I mentioned a few examples. It could be a breakdown of your vehicle. It could be um, uh, losing your job. It could be uh, having to make an un unplanned um, expense, uh, such as at times um, uh, a loved one, loss of a loved one, could be divorce, uh, could be maybe becoming disabled, uh, or a loved one becoming disabled, health issues. Uh, so there's quite a variety of things that can impact this. So uh, there are things that we can do and practice to be able to be more financially resilient. Uh, and that I could give you some here, but there's so many more beyond this. And, and you'll you'll find that out in this presentation and beyond this. Uh, we can build an emergency safety net. And what does that mean? It's just really having uh, uh, some money set aside, savings uh, of any kind, or start building that up so you can plan for those emergencies. So it's good to have that. But when I say plan uh, for my financial emergencies, it's also uh, even going through the, the simulation of it. Like, let's say, you, uh, how would you do, if something were to happen and you need to tap into that money, how would you do it? Uh, it's it's not a bad idea to actually simulate that experience and think about every step that you take. How would I access that savings? Uh, is it easy to to get to? Uh, how much is enough? You know, there's different recommendations out there. Some some say three months. Uh, I hear six months or even more of what you uh, of your income, of your planned expenses. Uh, so the important thing is uh, to have something there and also plan for it. And uh, and in addition to that, we can also, because I am a therapist and I work uh, with clients in uh, in that therapeutic setting, is there there are other things we can do as well to become resilient, and that's being uh, maintaining that positive view uh, for for challenges that come your way. So it's that like the expression of uh, using lemons to make lemonade, you know, re really helping yourself reframe situations that happen in your life to um, as opportunities or looking at them as um, in a more positive light, uh, being able to help ourselves stay focused and determined on our goals and things that we're working on, being flexible because we know that change happens in our lives and it's important that we stay and, and are flexible. Uh, then being organized, uh, that could be organized with uh, all of our personal documents, our finances, and many other aspects as well. And then being proactive, uh, being able to uh, wor work with the change rather than defend against it. So there are many things that we can do to help ourselves be financially resilient. Uh, in addition to that, it's also important that we recognize uh, that we are financially health, that we healthy, that we take note and account for this. Um, and why is it important that we uh, do this? It's and it's because we we need to really maintain that that sense of financial security, also have feel that we have some freedom of choices because that's what comes with being financially healthy. You've, you're able to meet financial obligations, you're able to spend wisely, you're, you're able to build some savings for short-term, long-term goals, um, and, and you're able to have that, that freedom and enjoy it of being able to have a, a greater amount of choices in the current time and in the future. So um, there are things we can do uh, to improve our financial health, uh, I mentioned like savings, budgeting, uh, but also just having a goals, uh, depending on what point of life you're in, if, if you're preparing for retirement, 
uh, or if you have children, preparing them for college and saving for that tuition, uh, or just in general, having that emergency fund, uh, or making maybe per major purchases, you're planning to purchase a house, a car, um, those are all things that we can set money aside and plan for it and build um, and, and prepare for so that we can be financially healthy. Because uh, the importance of being resilient financially and having good financial health is that we don't want to spend our life stressing and worrying about money. We did that survey early on. It looked like we had a 60-40 split. Uh, that ma majority weren't as stressed out, but we did have a few. Uh, and I think it's it's important that we recognize that uh, you know we are doing things to manage that stress if we are feeling stressed out. Uh, because what happens at times is that we overwhelm ourselves, we become exhausted, and just thinking about it, just thinking about it can be very exhausting, and then we become hopeless. And what happens is we trap ourselves in that vicious cycle, and uh, we start feeling alone and unable to know what to do. So uh, it is important that we recognize when we're on that state uh, and, and do things that we can help ourselves, because the more that we understand um, ourselves, where we are in our financial situation and place and time, the more we can act and do things for ourselves to uh, help us uh, move forward and uh, and manage that stress. So uh, for me, one of the important things that I like to talk about when it comes to this topic and uh, out in community or, or with clients, it's, it's that we, uh, we just, especially in Latino community, we just don't talk about it enough or uh, we weren't, we didn't grow up talking about it. So uh, I know uh, when I pose this question, why don't we talk about money? I, I get a variety of answers. Some of them can be because uh, uh, when it comes to family, like uh, I, it's not something we're used to talking about. It's not something I was taught to. Many of the things we practice in our lives is because we learned it. Um, so maybe we, we didn't grow up learning about finan uh, finances or talking about money. Uh, because maybe it was something that was a stressor in our family going up, uh, or even the fear of because of how we grew up. Um, there's also uh, the fear of how we might look to others uh, if we're not in a good financial state. So there's there's several and many reasons why we don't talk about money, but uh, the important thing is that we do, uh, that we become more comfortable and, um, and build that relationship with money. So uh, I wanted to to also highlight that um, that there was a study uh, by Cambridge University that says that kids that start learning about money as young as three um, and, uh, and start forming um, attitudes and feelings about money by age seven, the observations they saw is that they, they start to have, um, they, they were able to have uh, much better financial health and resilience. Um, and it, that means like being able to sit down and talk about um, what is uh, savings, what is a 401k, uh, how to, how, what is a good money behavior and habits. So th there's uh, a lot that we can do for uh, previous generations, but even for ourselves, for no matter where we're at uh, in, in life. And um, when I want to talk about relationship with money, I think it's very important that we, uh, that we take time to reflect and think about what we are doing and how we are doing uh, with our money, uh, our relationship with it. Because again, if we weren't uh, used to doing it, uh, it's important that we that we recognize that and do. Uh, because in childhood, for some of us, maybe uh, we 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 weren't used to it, uh, but we know that it is. We are influenced by whom and how we were raised. That makes a big plays a big factor in our relationship with money and our financial behavior. So uh, if we think about, did you grow up in a family where money was or wasn't discussed or uh, think about where uh, maybe money was a constant problem, it might change how we, uh, and shape us as we grow and into adulthood, early adulthood um, and how we manage and have attitudes and feelings about money. Uh, and our, when I talk about financial behaviors, uh, that can be from our, how much, uh, how we spend, how we save, how we let other people borrow money, how we share it. Um, all that is rooted in our childhood and influenced by family uh, and, and those financial experiences that we see uh, witness uh, growing up with money. Uh, there are other factors as well, uh, but I think it's it's uh, part of that shaping happens here in childhood. And, um, you know, sometimes maybe we felt uh, safe or unsafe, depending on how financially secure our family was, that can make a, a 
play a major influence in how we grow up and and manage our money in our in our future uh, selves and and into adulthood and older adulthood. So and again, it's never too late to um, take time to reflect and see where we are with our relationship with money, so that we can uh, practice healthier habits. When I mentioned uh, earlier about our fear, can be something that 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 uh, steers us away from um, doing well in our relationship with money and being financially secure and healthy. Uh, so what that fear could look like in terms of behaviors and how we uh, could be how we avoid money management and uh, whether like looking at at how much we have in our accounts or uh, or um, budgeting savings. Uh, it could also be even beliefs that you don't earn enough. Um, that's all internal thinking and thoughts that also uh, can be unhealthy. Maybe even feeling that we uh, don't deserve things, uh, feeling guilty of even wanting things, <clears throat> feeling incapable of managing our own finances, or even feeling powerless overall. So uh, we know that fear of money and finance can lead to avoidance of money behaviors, um, and that will really guarantee that you're going to have some, some negative outcomes if you don't address that. So it's it's definitely important that we, uh, if we do see or note this in ourselves and others, that we take time to to make those changes. Uh, some of those changes can include uh, our money habits. So uh, the there are many 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 types of money habits that we have, and I just listed some here. Uh, for that um, in my hopefully the text is is large enough that you can see, but. Uh, um, these are some some money habits that that we can practice uh, if if uh, and and help uh, help us in, in the long run and in in the um, short term as well. So whether it's uh, uh, oh, not overspending on gifts, uh, I know that especially if, um, for growing up, you know sometimes it feels like parents need, to, especially in Latino parents, to immigrate here. Uh, feel like they need to provide, provide for what they didn't have growing up. And, you know, uh, that that happens and uh, but, but it's a reality. Right. And and I think it's it's uh, really important to keep in mind that it's OK to spend and, and treat your kids and something that, they, that you never had and provide that, but not at the cost of creating stress for yourself, not at the cost for not having money to pay bills or so it's it's really important that um, and, and it's OK that um, there you can also impart lessons that way to your to your children and family that you know sometimes some some years that you may not have enough uh to pay to buy things or buy something special for that year and uh it's, it's not an everyday year thing but um as long as um you we practice this and we can model this for our future generations it could be healthy uh behaviors that we're teaching there impulse purchases there's a lot of reasons why we impulse purchase but uh that can uh, lead us down a, a rabbit hole of of debt, and it's important to monitor that. If you notice that you're that you're you're practicing that, and why you're doing it, so it takes a little more reflection and work there. But uh, it's it's something to to keep in mind of impulse purchases. Um, even using a shopping list uh, can be very, uh, and I, I like to use this when I'm talking with clients too, because I when I shop for food or groceries. I always try to make sure I shop when I'm not hungry because <laughs> I know that can uh, definitely steer me into a direction of overspending. And uh, so she, keeping a list of what you need to buy and sticking to that list uh, is, is a good money habit. Uh, paying things on time when you get your bills, paying your credit card uh, uh, and not keeping keep, you know, a, a, a balance to, uh, over for the next month, uh, paying um, online when possible. Etc. So there's quite a few uh, habits here that I listed as as examples of healthy money habits to practice. Um, but you might be asking, Felipe, how do I? Uh, this is so much this can be a very overwhelming. How do I? Where do I start? What do I? What can I do? So there are a lot of things that we can do to improve our money habits. Uh, and one of the ways is maybe just even thinking about how we're starting this. So uh, many times when we have goals, we tend to think about uh, achieving this goal by um, once you get to that outcome and that desired outcome that you that you you're done you finish you accomplish that goal but uh, there's a really great book that i recommend atomic habits and you can even apply it to financial uh, habits where you can actually think about yourself uh, as more of like a, like your identity based versus outcome based so regular goals can be more outcome based but identity based is like be the type of person that 
uh, is that that achieves that goal. So uh, that that means that whatever you do every day, uh, everything that you practice, that is the person that's going to accomplish that goal. So if you're trying to save money, um, well, if if it's just the certain you're trying to save a thousand dollars for that for that year, that's an outcome based. But if you're really uh, saving uh, often and uh, practicing saving all the time, then that's more and it becomes part of your identity. Uh, and if it gets easier to maintain that and sustain that than just outcome based, and so it could lead you to more success. Uh, another way to look at it is creating a scorecard, a way to kind of track your money habits. Uh, so I gave you an example here of how this could look like. I put my guilty pleasure of Starbucks coffee on there as, as an example. Uh, maybe that's not a great habit to have, so that's a minus. Uh, I, uh, if um, but meal prepping for lunch for work, if you do that every day for yourself for your family, that's a plus that because that saves you money. Uh, but that, that's a good habit to have. Purchasing groceries when hungry, maybe not a great habit to have. <laughs> minus. So, you know, you can kind of create your own scorecard list um, and, and really uh, do some reflective work here and, and, and really take a, take a look at your own spending habits and, and see what can be worked on. So this is a great way to grade yourself uh, and um, keep track of, of your progress. And, and, and do some work there for more effective, uh, healthy habits. Uh, the last tip here is, is also from uh, James Clear from Atomic Habits, and that's habit stacking. So if you already have an existing habit, so it helps to add uh, your new habit to that. So that, that's what that means. So if you already practice uh, meal prepping for lunch for work, well, maybe uh, I'm going to uh, add the grocery purchases to that habit. So I'm going to start purchasing uh, groceries when I'm not hungry, that are the groceries that I'm going to use for prepping my work. So that's uh, an addition of a new habit to an existing one. So uh, you can combine uh, habits and, and create new ones that way, because it's easier to uh, than starting from scratch. So uh, it, again, that this would take some time to really do some reflective work and, and see uh, what kind of money habits you practice. And then from there, give yourself some scoring and um, see where you need to work on. And, and track that up for yourself so you can start improving and, and doing better there. And then <clears throat> in terms of financial self-care, uh, definitely something that, that I, it, I find very important. Um, self-care in general is something I always uh, recommend for community and clients that I work with. It's, it's important to carve out time for ourselves, to take care of ourselves, and uh, self-care is really not something that you'd be practicing when it's an emergency. So uh, it's, it's something that you would just incorporate as part of your routine on a daily basis. Uh, and, and it can be many things. So I give you some examples here, but um, that scheduling time with your money could be a way to take care of yourself because you're dedicating time, uh, scheduled time uh, to ref uh, see where you, how you're doing, uh, see how well progress is made. Uh, so that's that that's a way to help yourself. Creating a, a, a money space, what that means is being able to create a, a safe space to talk about money in our families. Maybe we didn't grow up uh, practicing that, but maybe if we start that for ourselves and for our families, that can help us to uh, not just do well for ourselves, but really role model for the next generation and for the others that that's something that, that can be healthy to do. Sharing your journey, uh, I, I really, really, really believe in the power of storytelling and that uh, by you being able to share your progress, your journey can truly inspire others. And I'm always found, uh, uh, I'm always in awe of like the stories that I hear from community, from uh, other um, uh, people out, out, out there that, that, that will share their, their journey. Uh, sometimes it's financial journey, sometimes it's other parts of the journey that are really inspiring, but uh, I think that it's very moving and I think it could help um, also support you if you're able to share that journey with others and your progress. Uh, not confusing our self-worth with your network. You know, it's, it's really important that um, we really focus on our own self-worth and well-being. And, it's, um, and that does not, does not equate to how much money you make or how, you, how well you are financially. Uh, everyone's at a different point and place and time when they're working on themselves, when they're working on their financial health. And, um, and it, 
focus on you, not don't worry about the others. Uh, silencing your inner critic. We can be our harshest critic sometimes. Uh, our inner voice can be very, very uh, harmful. And I think it's important that we do take time and dedicate uh, work to, to silencing it and, and reframing things, looking at things in more positive ways. Uh, we can keep journals, we can schedule worry time, uh, forgiving yourself. I think that's an important thing to do. We all are going to make mistakes. We've made mistakes. Uh, and if you made a bad purchase, an ill-advised purchase, it happens, uh, learn from it, uh, forgive yourself, move forward, and uh, be able to, to, to do better. Uh, and then be able to set some goals uh, are, are important so that you can track your progress. I also want to recommend other ideas like uh, uh, be creative, do vision boards, um, visualization act, uh, activities can be very uh, uh, imaginative and, and, and Picturing that success for you and how that looks can be very fun and creative, or even something that you could do with your kids or family. Uh, so there are many things that we can do for our financial self-care. And I believe I would... Um, you want to leave it at that? Yes. Uh, All right. In terms of the content. <laughs> Not a problem. Let me tell you, well, first of all, to our audience, I welcome everybody who's joined us uh, for this talk. Just so you know, you already saw Felipe Ocampo, who's a licensed therapist. I'm Patricia Perez. I'm AARP California State President Emeritus. And we're here talking about being financially healthy and resilient. And it really does, this hits the, the core of where we are, right, is in terms of our attitudes about money. And uh, we started with a, a poll and it was, you know, like 60, 40, 60% 60 of the people are not too stressed about money, which is wonderful. But that meant 40% of us were. And I'm one of those who does worry, you know, about money, not like, you know, crazy, not lo losing sleep, but I do, I do. And so Felipe, let me just tell you the tips you gave were like awesome. And I was taking notes. So um, definitely um, those hit you know home. You talked about improving. Oh, I'm sorry. If anybody has a question, please add them on the comments or on the chat. We're going to try to get some of the questions going. So please, if you have a question, just write them down. Um, but anyway, back to you, Felipe. You talked about improving money habits and a scorecard, and you listed a bunch of things there. How can people prioritize those items on those lists, on our lists? Yeah, I think, I think uh, that really uh, depends on, on what you're maybe aligning it with your financial goals in life happen to be at that point in time. So uh, really um, consider that. That's something to consider and, and start to prioritize things based on your goals and, and what you want to work on. Uh, again, you can also look at it like an identity type of goal. So I really something that you become instead of just focusing on one tiny goal. So, uh, that, but I really think it's something that you should align with there. And then um, I think starting somewhere. So it's just really start, start somewhere and uh, make pivot, make adjustments, but it's good to start somewhere. Sorry. So you're saying something that you become? Yes. Uh, so, yeah. so when, when I, uh, back, uh, when I was referring to the habits and, and being yeah. able to form habits, it's, it's, uh, it can be much more healthier and successful at creating new habits if you make it more identity based. So if it's something that becomes part of you, as opposed to just making it that one singular goal that once you achieve it, you're done with. But if you just be like a savings, uh, instead of savings, make saving for one thing, but if you practice saving constantly, then you would like, that's something that you can be part of you uh, for forever. You can be uh, practice saving all the time. You got it. And I know you started by saying that uh, there was a study done on Latinos that, you know, the respondents didn't have $400 for an emergency uh, fund. Um, and, and you mentioned the emergency fund uh, kind of varies. How can people like define how much, uh, is it up to uh, each person or how should we figure out how much to have in an emergency fund? You know, I, I think the, the financial educators, there's uh, a lot of different recommendations about uh, how much to save, but I always go back to uh, 
depending on everyone's situation is different. So I think it's just important that you start setting some money aside as uh, uh, whatever you can and to, um, and, and, and that could be small. It could be a small chunk of, of income and puts whatever you can afford to save at that time. Because I know that at some situations that are much more different than others. Uh, but I know sometimes the recommendations tend to be like three months of, of income of what you spend on a monthly basis or six months as well. But really, it's just about where, where, where you can start, um, because I think practicing the, the habit of saving is, is great. Yeah. And, and like you said, now I get it that make that who you are, right? That's your identity rather than just going from goal to goal. I mean, it's great to have a goal, right? Because then you develop your plan. But if you make that who you are, that's wonderful. And I know several times we talked about, you know, how with Latinos, we don't talk about money, but really this applies to many ethnicities, many cultures. We weren't raised talking about money. And some of us, you know, who have known, you know, struggle uh, early in life, all we knew about money was that there wasn't enough. And uh, so, but I guess the attitude with money is not either how much or how little you have, correct? It's just your attitudes about it. True. And, and that could also mean uh, sometimes taking some time to uh, reflect. I think the power of reflection is important that we, they folk, uh, especially if uh, for struggling in, in our lives to be able to be more financially secure um, and, and really do some work there on, our, on ourselves. Um, and, and that could sometimes lead us to seek professional help. And sometimes we're able to do that on our own, but I think it's important to reflect and see where we're at. Good. Um, you listed some of the reasons, but what are the greatest challenges to people in developing actually good money habits? Uh, I think from what I see, uh, I see many times starting with some goals that are very unobtainable so that they set the goal to like the, they really want to get somewhere really quickly or at at such a looming amount or so I think just starting small baby steps start small uh give yourself uh successes early successes small successes so that you can build on and uh so that's something I I always recommend because if we shoot too high then what happens is we 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 won't get there and then we 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 get back into that cycle of of um being our inner inner critic uh you're 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 a failure you're and we get hopeless Uh, so just important to build those small small goals, incremental, and uh, and go from there. You know, uh, it's interesting because we did have another session on getting out of debt, and one of the suggestions was to pay off the credit card where you don't owe as much, like your lowest one, right? And it was just exactly to what you were talking about. It was that small success of saying, got rid of one. Uh, so before tackling the huge one, go with a small one, have that win, celebrate it. Exactly. So, yeah. That's a great example. All right. Perfect. We do have, let's see, a question is, do you know of networking groups that are safe to share the financial journey? You know, um, and this kind of, this is going to go a little to recommendations um, that I have for more resources. Uh, and it's really, um, there's, there's a, a good amount of podcasts now uh, of of uh, like Brown Ambition, uh, yo, yo Quiero Dinero. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What was the first one? Because I tell you, I'm kind oh, yeah. of taking notes. Oh, Br- Brown Ambition. So, uh, so I, I I really enjoy these two. Yo Quiero Dinero, Brown Ambition. So, uh, uh, I got to give it to to the ladies who stepped up to make these podcasts because they are um, they're creating spaces to be able to hear stories and and even share, so you can reach out to them. And they'll answer your your um your questions, or or you can see other people's similar situations. And sometimes they have uh, groups or forums that uh, online where you people can interact with each other. So that might be a space there. But um, I, I think that's a place to start. I don't know of any other forums that I would advise myself. But starting with those podcasts and then uh, other similar ones. I know NPR has money habits, uh, but then you might find some um, some community through those. Perfect. And you said brown ambition, correct? Correct. Mm-hmm. Brown ambition. Perfect. And I guess if if people know of other podcasts, financial subject podcasts that you find empowering or informative, you know, sh- share them with us too. But those are wonderful. I, I'm adding those to my list too. 
Uh, Felipe, what are some of the uh, common mistakes that people make that prevent them from becoming financially resilient? You know, I think one of the things is that we uh, forget that we need to be well in general for our health, that, um, that, and especially in, you know, Latino culture of like, you want to help everyone else, you want to help the family, you want to help so-and-so, but, yes. you know, you got to start with you first. If you want to help others, you need to be well. So I think uh, focus on yourself first, be well in all aspects of fin your health, financial health and overall health is, is extremely important. Um, start there before we can get to others. You're right. You're right. And, and you're talking about the attitude about money, right? With, with many times it, it comes from, you know, our childhood, the family, our culture. It's like, you know, you don't talk about money. You don't, it's kind of gauche. You just don't do that. And so we grow up without the necessary tools. Exactly. Even in relationships, uh, how many times maybe is that a source of conflict? Do we do we ask those questions and maybe about uh, finances before even pursuing yes. marriage? Like uh, there's a lot of things oh, that we don't yes. think about the importance of finances. And uh, and I think we, because we're uncomfortable, but I think it's important that we find spaces to feel safe to talk about it. Yeah. And Felipe, I know that many times, I mean, some of the suggestions, right? Have a plan, make it a part of your life, all of that. But sometimes there's things that are like beyond our control, like let's say like the stock market, right? Some of us may be retired and we have our money and we, how do, can we stop from worrying about things that may happen? Hypo, all these hypotheticals. Yeah, you know, it, it's good to stay informed, but also there's a balance. So I think we have to make sure we know how to set boundaries for ourselves, you know, how much should, how much time should I dedicate to stay informed, be a uh, check in on my, my accounts or um, my financial health? Because I think if we, if we don't set that boundary, we can get really stressful and overwhelmed. So I think it's just make, maintaining and setting those boundaries are very important. All right. We have an interesting question here and it's come up with me personally, where sometimes family just, you know, comes to you and asks you for a loan or to purchase something, can you give an example of how people can say no to family when they ask you either to purchase an item or get a loan, you know, or give them a loan? No, it, that's, that's uh, going back to, um, you know, boundaries, right? I think it's something that it's hard sometimes, especially when it's family. Uh, but I think it's important that, especially if it's something that you, um, you have to know for yourself, is this something I'm expecting to get back or am I giving this without the expectation? So making those, that boundary very clear and expectation very clear of how this, uh, but if you're setting, if you're going to have that difficult moment of saying no to someone, you know, that's, that's you. It's not, the, it's not a bad thing. It's, it's okay to set that boundary for yourself and to say no to someone, even if it's family, uh, because if you're not in a place where you can do that, or um, it's, it's okay. Um, and I know that, that sometimes we beat ourselves up or we, um, we feel really bad about it, but I think uh, it's, it's an actually healthy decision to set, to make sure we um, set that for ourselves. That. So we can pretty much just say no. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's saying no, at this time, you're not able to. Uh, and But, you know, if you can have maybe an alternative resource for them, you can direct them to that. That's how you can support them. Uh, or if there's a smaller way you can support them, I can't help you in this way, but I can help you this way. So um, providing them an alternative. And um, But if it's something that you're not able to, or that's not something you're comfortable with, it's it's not a bad thing to, to say no. Uh, but, you know, you can do... Uh, your part in finding alternatives and sharing that or you know if you can't at that moment that's okay to say no and you know that goes to one of the items that you had in one of your lists of forgive yourself and you know okay to make mistakes and just kind of move on because I have been asked by family to co-sign on loans to co-sign on things and you know like you know I don't want to say like a tonta but I did it right and and now it's just like an experience, uh, a learning experience. So unless you want to have issues with your family, suggestion is keep it separate. Yeah. There's an expression in, in uh, 
cuentas claras, amistades, uh, uh, I forget it, but I hear it so often, cuentas claras, amistades buenas, or like something yeah. to that effect. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. but now whenever a, a relative or anybody asks me for like, can I borrow? Can I, you know, will you lend me? I figure this is a gift, you know, <laughs> because I know it's not going to be back. I don't want to have uh, any issues with it. Uh, let's see, we have another uh, question here, and it's, how can we recognize a scarce, the, let's see, sorry, one second. Uh, I'm sorry. How can, oh, how can we recognize a scarcity mindset about money? Do you have encouraging words to identify that mindset? You know, so scarcity mindset is really when you grow up like with uh, limited resources or feeling like their resources are limited. So I think it's um, it's really more about being able to uh, recognize that that's something that you're you're doing or you're thinking. Uh, and then um, and 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 if sometimes it may be seeking professional help if you can't address this yourself because that sometimes happens too. But I, I think it's important to recognize that's how that's how you're operating and then. Uh, working on it, you know, putting in the work to to um, to help yourself um, improve in that area. Uh, I I think for me, it's it's first we got to recognize that that's it's something that we need to work on, and then implementing steps to 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 improve in that. When it comes to um, decision making, uh, really sometimes it could be um, taking time to reflect on how we make our financial decisions. Um, sometimes we uh, we are hearing that feedback from our loved ones or our friends or family that notice this for us. So just be mindful of that because it might be someone that's recognizing it for you. So uh, be, being open to that feedback and then taking time to um, put it down on paper if you might have if you have to, and then how would you uh, do things differently? Uh, but there are things that we can do for ourselves. And again, also if you, if you something you find yourself unable to manage on your own. There are professional uh, assistance that you can get for that. And you know, it, I this is from my own personal experience. I sometimes go from the scarcity mindset to abundance based on if I want something, right? If I want to buy something, it's just like, oh, I've worked hard. I deserve this. I, I earned it. And sometimes it's, you know, this, I don't have money or, you know, it's just kind of uh, helps, I guess, uh, you know, us justify these bad decisions, but following some of the recommendations and plans that you set forth and we make it part of our lifestyle, that kind of helps balance those two extremes. Yeah, because trust me, I mean, I you even one of your bullet points was do not play the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> but the minute you see these mega millions, it's just like, let's run and get tickets. All right. Um, let's see. There, there's a question, too. Is somebody wants you to please go over the 4% rule? The 4% rule. Is that yeah. uh, maybe one of the, was that listed on the habits or? You know what? Whoever asked that question, please, if you clarify. Yeah, you can clarify. Yeah, if you clarify, not a problem. You know, well, we do this. Why don't we take another poll? Let's, you know, let's ask a, a, another poll question. So please, if I, you know, ask my ARP pals to please post the, the second poll question. And it is, I feel more prepared to manage my financial well-being. Felipe gave some fantastic um, tips and which, by the way, Felipe, where can they access your slides or your recommendations? How can we uh, access? You know what? Actually, we're recording this. So the recording will be available on the Let's Talk Dinero. Maybe that would be the, the way to access this. Uh, oh, that is fantastic. 85% of the people uh, joining us feel a little bit better. And these are practical tips, you know, that nothing was like, you know, difficult. Everything seemed achievable, doable, something we could implement today in a way. Um, so thank you so much. 
So wonderful. I, I think people got some good information. They feel a little bit more prepared. All right. Oh, that's wonderful. Almost 90%. That's good. All right. Okay, let me close this. Um, so please, if anybody has any questions, this is your opportunity to, to ask. So, um, oh, and uh, Priscilla on the chat said that you're able to access a recording, uh, you know, to this session on the aarp.org, Let's Talk Dinero. And, you know, we call this actually, this these sessions, Let's Talk Dinero for a reason, right? Because you were saying, Felipe, we don't want to talk about it. So here we are, we're putting it out there. And, uh, you know, this is our affirmations. All right. Um, where can people go for, for more information for some of the resources that you've talked about? Uh, you know, Felipe, where, where else can people go? You know, there's, um, you know, there's a lot of different avenues nowadays. So there's the, whether through a podcast or YouTube, there's some, a lot of good information that you can do some personal research in. Uh, I, I mentioned a few of the, one, the ones that I like to, to listen to, because it's just about maintaining that open mind of hearing new ideas um, through, through podcasts, but there's, um, I think your ARP website is an excellent tool for the community. Uh, I myself don't have any content besides what I've showed you here, uh, but hopefully in the future I may develop something because I do think it's important for a Latino community that we have as many tools as possible. But really the, the important thing is uh, remember to start, start in your homes, have those conversations, start those reflections for yourself. Uh, but really the, the, the broadcast that I mentioned were Brown Ambition and Yo Quiero Dinero or two yes. uh, that I frequent uh, for in terms of resource. Yeah, and and we're talking about resources and uh, where you can access information. Well, first of all, there are many programs that can be helpful, you know, on your financial well-being. We, of course, always recommend that you consult a professional who can help you based on your individual situation and future needs. I don't mean necessarily a therapist. We mean a financial planner or some, you know, an accountant to help you. But I also want to mention that ARP has many online resources uh, available, which includes the aarp.org slash retirement planning and aarp.org slash money. So those are, you know, great to help you uh, develop a budget and tips for saving and developing good money habits, like the ones the, that that Felipe mentioned. Um, and Felipe, some of the questions are very specific. Some someone has a question about: Is it better to invest in property <laughs> <laughs> or a new car? <laughs> yeah, every every situation is different, right? Uh -huh. I think that's that's right. true, and at that. Um, but really it's something to, maybe that question might be more for an, an advisor. Uh, I think I, my, I try to focus myself when I get those questions in therapy and like, you know, what, how are you, or is that something, it's a healthy decision that you're ready for, whether it's house or car, but uh, to create that safe space to have those conversations. That's, that's, I think the important thing for me. Yeah. And I loved the suggestion of involving the family. Um, you know, nothing to be embarrassed about it, you know, money should be something that we hide from or, you know, hide from our, our family from our children. So that's always a, a great suggestion is developing these plans involving the family, and, uh, and having that, you know, those conversations with them. Um, uh, there's a question uh, here. It says, I have enough money saved up to take a family vacation, but I feel guilty. I'm not sure if I should spend money on a vacation right now. Yeah. So uh, for those situations, I think it's uh, important, like the, the um, how are you in terms of uh, if you have the emergency fund, if you've done the, the things that you need to do to feel financially secure, then it, and it is okay to treat yourself sometimes, right? That's part of the self-care as well. 
if it's a uh, family um, routine or, or um, a ritual or something that you practice together, uh, that's also important. And if it's if you're in a financially secure situation, then uh, then then that's a great thing to do. And then sometimes too, we we can also think about ways to do um, activities or that are that are less costly. It doesn't have to be so extravagant. There are ways to still do family vacations that that don't have to be uh, so so over the budget. So there's a lot that you can consider in that in that space. Yeah. And Felipe, I was mentioning how I sometimes go from a scarcity mentality to one of, you know, abundance based on my attitude, I guess, what I'm feeling uh, at that time. Uh, what what are some signs that, that people should look out for, for emotional spending? Like, what are some of those triggers? You know, and, um, you know, things, if you notice uh, yourself maybe look, becoming a little jealous because your peers or friends or others have things that maybe, and then you, so you seek to get those things because of that jealousy, if uh, maybe feeling guilty that um, for something, and so you treat yourself to alleviate that guilt. If it's fear, uh, maybe you're using it as a distraction from, from whatever is causing that fear. Or uh, if you're looking at just to boost your mood, whenever you're sad, you you shop so that you don't feel sad. You know, that's, that's a momentarily uh, thing that, that helps in that moment, but it's not something that's actually working on your, that sadness. So I think it's important to understand uh, why we make those purchases um, and, and do that reflective work. And again, if, if you need to talk to someone professionally to get that help, but um, to, to uh, start that process first of recognizing for ourselves uh, if we notice that we're overspending or if we're, if we're spending too much or there's specific times that we find ourselves making those purchases. You know, Felipe, you talked about jealousy and just being, you know, envidioso, right? That uh, the competitiveness, that keeping up with, with other people, many times that also happens with children, right? That they feel like so-and-so has it, why can't I? How can we teach children about financial self-care? Yeah, and I, I, that's a great question because I think the, for especially for our Latino parents, uh, it's it's a difficult one because again we the, our parents might um, want to provide what they didn't have, so there there there's that internal struggle of uh, overspending or getting uh, overdoing it when really uh, you, it's the most important thing in that uh, relationship is love and care and support and everything else is extra. And if you can afford to get them those things, then that's great. But if if you're going into debt and you're stressed out, um, then there's what greater lesson to teach them than um, you know, uh, making the financially healthy decisions uh, and that the most important thing is love and support um, rather than materialistic things. And what is, uh, you gave us some tips. What are some things that we can do, like some of us are grandparents, that we can start teaching our grandkids? What oh, are some I, lessons? In my ideal world is uh, teaching them uh, about uh, how to save, what is, a, what is a 401k, what is a Roth IRA. There's a lot of, uh, of uh, fin financial uh, spaces that we don't know about and we're teaching ourselves. I found myself learning from my wife, how to, what is a Roth IRA? And there's maybe our, our older generation knows of how to access those financial um, institutions or what those things are, so teaching them about that. And then imparting that knowledge can be very empowering and also helping, instead of maybe purchasing a physical gift, I'm going to put it in that, uh, I forgot the plan, but for a college tuition plan. So parents, instead of buying physical things, can start building that college tuition from childhood. So grandparents could also do that and role model for others, um, helping support them in that way. Right. And in your opinion, it's okay, right, for us as grandparents to just, you know, take that on, you know, with the grandkids having these conversations rather than going with our own kids and saying, you should tell your kids about this. What do you think? Okay. Yeah, I think it's, it's or are important we overstepping? to, to, to uh, recognize, uh, you know, check in with your, it's good to, to have that dialogue, right? If it's good to, to um, talk with, talk with the family. Is that something that's okay that I do? Is it okay that uh, I want to, I want to get this for uh, the grandchild? Um, and uh, what do you think? Or is it okay if I, 
do this for them. So there's nothing wrong with with having those conversations. And I think it just makes, again, creates, creates more of an open space to, to talk about finances. That's perfect. All right, we're getting close to the end. So if anybody has any questions, please add them to the chat. Uh, uh, but let's see, somebody has a question. How often should they review their money scorecard? So that, that idea, you know, it'll, it's good to have um, uh, maybe at least once a week, not something to do, um, to do something every day. So we don't want to overstress yourself, but just have a routine, um, make sure it's a habit of checking of if that could be useful for you. Uh, so it, it's not an exact, like you need to, to do it every day, but at least on a routine basis, once a week, uh, as, as you find yourself becoming practicing healthier habits, financial habits, maybe the scorecard isn't even as necessary because you're already practicing that yourself. It's become a habit. It's natural, it's instinctual. So um, you can start off on a weekly basis, but it might grow out to, to be phased out. Perfect, and like you said, right? Have a space, have an area, have time dedicated uh, to do that. So that way it just becomes your habit. And just like with, with everything else, uh, you plan your meals, you plan everything, you plan your financial future and, and to be okay. Um, let's see. And somebody was saying that, um, you know, that a friend of, of theirs uh, purchases stock for his grandchildren. That is like awesome. You know, that is wonderful. And they may not see the benefits now. You let them know. I mean, you know, I just invested in you and your future. That's like wonderful. And uh, I know that many of us are learning these habits as, as adults, but what a wonderful gift to give to our grandkids, to our kids, uh, so they don't have to go through this, you know, stress later on in life. Uh, let's see. I want to let people know that they're, um, that AARP is here for you with resources and events to help you choose how you live as you age, and you can find resources and information once again at aarp.org slash retirement planning and aarp.org slash money. Felipe, I know we're getting close to the end of the sessions and if more questions come, I'll ask, but um, are there additional comments, recommendations? Do us a, you know, a a brief summary recap of what you just shared with us today. You know, I think just remember that it's um, starting small habits uh, and it requires, it's a change. So change takes time and be kind to yourself. Uh, learn, remember that, that uh, the changes you make, the, there are opportunities that you're role modeling for the next generation, for others. Uh, but, you know, start small for making, making those changes and, and start where you can, start where you're able to. And for many of us, money is uncomfortable, so we procrastinate. We put it off, put it off. Unfortunately, this is not a, a subject that, you know, we should, uh, you know, that we can put off for, you know, very long. And like you said, we're not just doing it for ourselves. We're doing it for our family. Many of us, you know, our family depends on us. We're doing it for our grandkids, for the future of the familia. So, it, and like you said, if you are okay, then you're lifting others, right? Like, like they, they teach us it on the airplane. Exactly. All right. Well, we're getting close to the end. Uh, thank you so much for joining us in our charla. Let's talk dinero. We will continue featuring experts to help us build our financial security, covering topic, topics such as debt management, investing, retirement planning, entrepreneurship, and lots more. Please, anybody watching us, mark your calendars for Monday, March 20th for our next Let's Talk Dinero event with topic details to come. But you can visit uh, us at aarp.org, Let's Talk Dinero. You can view recordings from, you know, other events, including this one. This one will be up, you know, soon. So you can check this video. And you can also see the list of upcoming events. Remember, aarp.org slash Let's Talk Dinero. A huge thank you to Felipe for sharing his expertise with us and to all of you for joining us. We have come to the end of our session. Have a wonderful evening. Felipe, mil gracias. And see you all on March the 20th. Hasta luego.
Hasta luego.